The Last Ride, a deep dive into a shocking unsolved mystery. These two young men disappear off the face of the earth, and the last person to see them live was this sheriff's deputy. His stories were so unbelievable. Listen to The Last Ride podcast, part of the NPR Network. Just a quick note. This episode contains strong language. Please be advised. As a new Denverite, I'm always out looking for a new local favorite. Artists, musicians, museums, and of course, favorite places to eat. The Denver food scene is vibrant. There are great restaurants that many people will recommend, but there are also new restaurants, pop-ups and food trucks hidden away, waiting to be discovered. Two of my favorites, a food truck and a restaurant, are run by the same guy, Jose Avila. For Jose, food was a big part of Jose's life growing up in Mexico. Going back when I was growing up, we really need never see each other. Jose's family lived a hectic life, and Jose's mom wanted to slow everyone down and find some time to be together. So my mom, very clever, find a, a time so we can just sit down and just see each other for even just uh, for a little bit. And my mom picked this place called uh, Pozolerias. These memories of enjoying family meals in a beautiful setting were very powerful for Jose and set him on a path to work in a kitchen. I started working there as a bosser. You know, my first day was a Friday. I started working at five. By six, I was getting my ass kicked. I go back to the kitchen um, with my tray full of dirty dishes. And, you know, there was just one machine and just screaming and fire and uh, cussing and uh, doing all these kind of things. But it was a, a really well-organized uh, chaos, I would say. Today, Jose is a big deal in the local food scene. Jose developed his skills at restaurants in Denver's Cherry Creek neighborhood. He went from being a busboy to being an award-winning chef at his restaurant La Diabla, a restaurant which mixes tradition and modern, and in many ways retains the spirit of his meals with his mother. Jose's story is just one of many stories about Denver's food industry workers. This time, we hear stories from the frontline restaurant workers who we don't often hear from. The work is hard, but there are many rewards. It's a chance to reach people through food and touch their lives in a special way. This is my story so far. The storytelling podcast that brings you voices from the hidden corners of Colorado. I'm your host, Luis Antonio Perez. In this episode, we'll hear two stories about finding ways to move forward when everything seems lost. On a Monday evening, just west of downtown, a close, small community of food industry workers, of servers, chefs, former chefs, bartenders, and managers, gathered to listen to stories at the quirky and retro meeting space at Rag and Bale. Our first story comes from Mario Childs. Mario was reluctant to share his story. He said he didn't think he had a story to share. But when I asked him how he ended up in Colorado, from his hometown of Memphis, he said that it all started by getting stranded and experiencing homelessness. Here's Mario. To start off with, everybody must know that I am Memphis. I come from Memphis, Tennessee. I was born and raised there. I spent my whole entire life there until I got here. So how I got here is interesting because Like, you ever had a friend that you trust with your life and you would do anything for or go anywhere with? Well, that's how I got here. My best friend actually came to my house one day and and he was like, let's go to Colorado for my birthday. It's the weekend. We'll be back in Memphis Monday. And I'm like, man, I'm not going to no Colorado. I don't know nothing about Colorado. And he was like, man, come on, I knew you would go. I bought the ticket already. I'm like, you bought a ticket for real? And he threw it on the table. True enough, it said Denver, Colorado. So I'm like, okay, well, it is his birthday. I might as well just go go up there with him. He done bought the ticket or whatever, you know. So we get on the bus. True enough, we get here. I'm happy. We go to the dispensary. I ain't never seen that much weed in my life. I'm like, what the? 
is this real? Like, y'all got this in one building? Like, and he was like, yeah, dude, come on, we're going to have fun and everything. You know, we went to, I think it was 7 Eleven on uh, Larimore, Larimore Street, if I'm saying that right, downtown. And I went in and got me some water, got me a few other things, come out, and they were gone. So I'm standing there, like, okay, they done went around the corner. They must have double parked or something. I'm waiting. 30 minutes done went by. You know, so I'm calling this guy. Hey, dude, where you at? No answer, no text, no nothing. So now I'm scared because I'm in this new city, new state. I don't know nothing. I'm standing there and I don't know where to go. I ain't know what to do. And probably about an hour later, they came back. And he was like, man, I can't do you like this. I can't leave you on the street. I'm just gonna take you to the shelter. And I'm like, wait, to the shelter? So the guy pulled up to the shelter. He was like, dude, I'm sorry, but this it. He pulled my stuff out. So they literally ditched me as soon as we got here. And I was so upset when I seen my stuff, you guys. It was like, I just lost everything. Like my house, my business, my dogs, my everything in Memphis just in the blink of an eye, you know. I didn't have no way back home. People back home don't have it to get me back home. So. Being at the shelter was an experience for me because I had never been homeless before. So I didn't know what to do, who to talk to, who not to talk to. I just talked to God. It was a long journey. I was homeless up here for almost a year and a half. I slept on the ground, never done that before, under trees. That was like the wildest experience I ever went through. But I never gave up and I prayed and so far, God been putting all the right people in my life. I went from being intake in the shelter to staff in the shelter, to counselor in the shelter, to helping homeless people get off the street, putting them in assisted livings, getting them jobs. And it, it progressed from there. But I got a job up here. I got me a little place. I actually met my wife at work at the shelter. And then I went to school to an entrepreneurial class. I was, I was in this class and this, my teacher said something. She was like, you gotta find your niche. When you find your niche and then everything will work out for you. And at that moment, the only thing I could think about was my Uncle Albert Jr. My Uncle Albert Jr. could barbecue ribs that will fall apart and your mouth was just fall apart with the reels. I'm talking about they so good, you know? And everybody used to sit around and be like, telling him how it was so good. And he always had the music and stuff going. It's like a lifelong dream. I always wanted to be like my uncle. He always made people happy and he always fed them. And every time they see him, they would smile, you know? So in that moment, I felt like that maybe I should bring Memphis style barbecue up to Colorado so y'all can get a taste of what I, I love. So one day I called my wife, I said, I don't wanna work for nobody anymore. She was like, really? I was like, yeah, I don't wanna do this no more. I wanna come home and work on my trailer and build that and get it going. And she said, okay, do it. Come home and start working on it. And that's what I did. It took me two and a half years, but I built everything put everything together. I made sure it went through inspection. And it was hard. It was hard to build it. I built it from the ground up. Uh, my wife and I, we found the right pop-up trailer and I converted it from a pop-up trailer into a food trailer, which led to the Southern Pit. I would like to say no matter what you go through, if you don't give up, you will make it. It's, it's all about what you have inside of you because I could have gave up when they left me here and I could still be homeless on drugs and doing other stuff, God knows what. But I didn't give up because I was always taught to never quit.
No matter what situation you get in, just don't quit. Because there's always going to be a better way on the other side of whatever you came through. But we have to go through something in order to get something. So I went through a lot, learning a new city, learning new people, new ways. But now I feel like I've achieved a small goal of mine, which was to be in the food industry. But my goals are way, way bigger than where I'm at right now. I have an idea for Little Memphis. That's what I want to call it, Southern Pit Memphis style barbecue. Little Memphis, and if I can somehow get me a lot or a spot or something permanent, I am going to create a spot where you can actually come and experience my city here in your city. That's my goal. So if you haven't tried the Southern Pit, please take time to come to Thornton and see me, I'm Mario, and enjoy some of the experience of the Southern Pit. And thank you for believing in the Southern Pit. From the mountains to the south, put this meat in your mouth. Keep it going for Mario. Mario is still looking for a permanent location. In the meantime, you can find his food truck north of Denver in Thornton, Colorado and on the Southern Pit Instagram page. Find it linked in our show notes. After the break, we'll hear from a former restaurant manager of the year who had to face some serious challenges and decide between an industry that she loved and her own mental health. Hi, I'm Emily Williams. I'm one of the producers who work behind the scenes to help bring you my story so far. Our team makes this show because we want listeners to hear these stories. First-person, unfiltered, live storytelling. Coloradans sharing their experiences on stage for the first time ever. And we want to spread the word. So could you help us out? If you know someone who might like this podcast, please take a minute and share it with them. If you know two people, even better. Thanks for listening, sharing, and helping more people discover my story so far. Our next storyteller simply goes by the name Sox. She's a longtime food industry worker and involved with an organization named Chow, who offer mental health resources and support specifically to food industry workers. Sox started in the industry right out of high school and over the years developed a passion for the industry, eventually growing into a role as one of Denver's best restaurant managers. So it was hard when 20 years into her career, Sox found herself on an airplane questioning the industry she loves. My story through the hospitality world is a little weird, especially considering where it's at at this particular moment. So I wasn't even 18 years old when I started like working in hospitality. I just gotten out of high school. My friend got me a job. I started off as like the room service slash busser kid for a restaurant attached to a Holiday Inn in Colorado Springs. And but it was insane. And it was like a perfect fit for me because I was a hyperactive kid that loved to talk and I like thrived on the chaos and just, I didn't, I mean, I was getting paid to talk and I never stayed in one spot because I was running room service. So I was like all over the place. And I ended up working there for like three and a half years and a lot of crazy stuff while I worked, happened while I worked at that hotel. But one day that really sticks out is about a year and a half after I started working there, I had just gotten a fake ID. Me and my friends came up with this elaborate, nefarious plan for me to get my fake ID. And so all my coworkers knew I got it and everybody was so excited So I, because I could finally go out drinking with them, right? So we go to this little dive bar, this little hole in the wall, shithole right around the corner from the restaurant. And we start drinking Southern Kamikazes, which if anybody has had one, you know that that is like a mistake waiting to happen but we did it anyways and it was great man I was loving every minute of it like I finally felt like I had bonded with all my co-workers like 
I could go out and drink with them and be part of the group and experience all this stuff and we could share our war stories. And, and so I kind of took that bonding with people as a roadmap or a, like a stepping stone for everything I would do in life. Like I would use alcohol for awkward situations. I would use it to bond with people in social settings, working in restaurants. It was like the way we decompress, the way we celebrated. I mean, no matter what, we found a reason to drink, but we'd always find some reason you know, we'd be like, oh, we had a bad day. Let's go get drunk. Oh, we had a good day. Let's go get drunk. So my drinking just kept progressing, like, through my entire time as I worked in the hospitality industry. And I'm also, like, you know, slowly moving up the chain, you know, taking on more responsibility and more responsibility. Until one day, like, 20 years later, I find myself on an airplane and I'm sober for the first time which is crazy because I've traveled a lot. Like I've been all over the world, but this is the first time I've ever flown sober. And the reason why I'm on this plane sober is because I'm flying to Chicago to check myself into a 28 day rehab program and I can't show up wasted. So I get to Chicago and I check myself in and it was nerve wracking, but as I started to settle in, like rehab was, a great place for me to be. I had no responsibilities. You know, you're there just to focus on yourself and take a look at how you got in these situations and learn skills so that you can like better yourself and not repeat all these things. And so as resistant as I was to actually go to rehab for years, I swore I'd never go. Like I told everybody, but I actually started to really enjoy it there. And it like helped me build up all this confidence, like I could actually do this. And, and I also, while I'm in rehab, I find out that I won this big award from the Colorado Restaurant Assist Association for like manager of the year. So like, I am pumped. Like I, I'm coming back to Colorado. You know, I've done all this hard work. I've done the hard stuff. I've gone to rehab, like, Life is gonna be fantastic when I get back. My career's taking on a whole new level. I'm sober, I've got, everything's perfect, right? Rehab is like the honeymoon fun vacation before you start all the actual work. Because when you get back, it's like, not only are you dealing with everyday life again, but then there's like recovery coaches, therapies, groups, like all these things you're supposed to do to keep up with your recovery. It's like a part-time job within itself. But I'm like, I'm still, I'm gonna do this, right? Like my life is set up perfect. It's gonna be a fairy tale from here on out. Like everything's on this golden path. That fantasy starts to fade really, really quick as reality starts to kick in. So I fly back and I land at like after 10.30 at night. So it's a Saturday night. By the time I woke up the next morning, I had four missed calls from my restaurant wondering where I was at. I had not even been back in the state for 12 hours and they expected me to already be back there doing everything. So quickly I'm like, this isn't gonna be like the simple breeze that I thought it was gonna be. It doesn't take long and things start cracking. And as work starts to take over, I start to let things go by the wayside. You know, first it starts with, well, I don't need a therapist and a recovery coach. I'll, I'll get rid of one. And then it's like, I don't need to go to two group sessions a week. I'll go to one. And slowly, like, my recovery became less important and work was taking over. And then there's just the stress, you know, being there like 60, 70 hours a week and dealing with everybody's problems. And it just starts to build. And... I know that I'm like, I know that I'm cracking. I know that my foundation is getting wobbly, but I can't, I don't tell anybody. Like I just lean into work more and more because I didn't want to let everybody down. Like all the people that were so proud of me that I was doing so well and like 
all the money and resources that went into me going to rehab and to get that time off of work. And I'm like, it's okay. I'm just, I'm going to get through this. I just have to work harder and eventually it'll, it'll all work itself out. But the more I lean into work, the more it like starts pushing back and it just keeps building and keeps building. And I think your old drinking buddies, when you quit drinking, they will wait till you're weak. Like they can smell it on you or something. And then they will ask you like, oh, let's go get drinks. And one day I break. And I mean, when I break, I mean, I crumbled and I decided to go have drinks with one of my coworkers. And everybody knew I was teetering, like I was on my last edge. I think there was even a pool going around the restaurant on whether or not I was gonna keep, like if I was gonna quit because things were getting so bad. And so I go and we have a couple of drinks and then those couple of drinks turn into a couple more. And then I go home and instead of going to bed, I have a couple more drinks and it just all starts over again. And honestly, I don't know how many days I lost because I hadn't had a drink in like four months and I just went on a full on bender. So it, I was probably down like drunk for like three or four days and then I was probably sick for like three or four days, you know? And I tried, like after that little episode, I, I tried to go back, but I couldn't do it. My heart wasn't in it. I felt like a piece of shit. I had let everybody down, you know, like I had no confidence and, and I could not go back to the restaurant. I just couldn't do it. And so I'd go into like this huge, deep depression. I mean, I don't think I barely left my apartment for like two months, but I didn't know what I was gonna do. I'd been working my entire life to get to the point where I was and I had destroyed that. And I kind of hated it. Like I loved my job and I was really good at it, but it wasn't fun. I mean, one of the reasons why when I was younger and I got into the hospitality industry is because I had fun. I actually liked people. I liked talking to people, you know? It was like a good time. But what I've learned is with more responsibility, like it becomes less about the everyday interactions with people and just more stress and all of these things. And so I really didn't know what I was gonna do. And so one day I find a listing on Craigslist under the gig section to go work this taco festival. And it's like a four hour gig and I sign up just to be their ice runner for this festival. So all I have to do is take bags of ice from all these little taco tents like on this property, right? And I'm like, okay, cool. It's four hours. It's not that big of a commitment. I can handle this. Like if I have an anxiety attack, like I can bail, you know, I'll just be in the back running ice. I won't have to communicate with people. And I show up and the guy's like, oh, we need you to do something else while you're at this taco festival. We need you to like help with the recycling thing. And I agree because I didn't know I could say no, honestly. But I had fun. For the first time in a really long time, I just got to like interact with the general public. And I didn't have any responsibilities. Like, my God, I'm pointing out, like, put the green cups in the green basket, you know? And so while I'm there, I'm like, wait, I don't have to get a real job again. Like, I live in Denver and there's always stuff going on. So I can just, like, work all these weird festivals and, like, stay busy but I don't have to have the responsibility of any of that other stuff. And there's actually no chance of me accidentally getting responsibility because they last like two or three days. And that's basically what I've been doing for like the last year and a half is I'm just a gig worker and I go to all these crazy events. I do catering, I've done races, like Comic-Con, just all sorts of this crazy stuff. And I actually have fun again. Like I enjoy people. I get to go to these amazing venues, you know, I get to see some places I never get to. And sometimes they suck. Like there's been a few gigs that I'm like, ah, oh, shit, what did I get myself into? But the thing is, 
in four to eight hours, they're going to be over. And I don't ever have to think about going there again. Or like, I don't like a company. I'm like, I'm never working with you again. And it also gives me more time to focus on things like recovery or like some of my volunteer stuff that I do, like with Chow. It also gives me time to hang out with like my extended family. Now when people ask me if I want to do something, I can just say yes. And I don't have to worry about like getting permission from anybody or anything. They're like, hey, you want to go to a yoga retreat? I'm like, I don't know why, but sure. And honestly, it's like my biggest failure has kind of turned into one of my greatest accomplishments because where I am now compared to where I was even before I went to rehab, even before I got super depressed, is so much different. Like, I'm just happy. I'm more relaxed. Like, I can actually live life again. And I'm still in the same industry that I love, but I'm just on a different path. And it's a pretty awesome path so far. So thank you guys. Socks and Mario's stories remind me of the importance of finding a way to have the pursuit of achievement and the pursuit of happiness work together and having the courage to ask ourselves tough questions to find that balance. Thank you to our storytellers, Sox and Mario, and everyone else who shared a story that night. Thanks to Chow for helping us connect with storytellers. Chow stands for Culinary Hospitality Outreach and Wellness. They're an organization whose mission is to support wellness within the hospitality industry and to help improve lives through shared stories, skills, and resources. Find out more about their programs and services at chowco.org. Thanks also to Rag and Bale for hosting our event. Next time, we'll bring you more stories from another community in Colorado. My Story So Far is a show that collects first-person stories from hidden communities across Colorado. If your community has stories to share, let us know. Find us at cpr.org slash community audio. This show is produced by me and Emily Williams. Our editor is Joe Erickson. You can find a list of everyone who works on this podcast in the show notes. For Colorado Public Radio, I'm Luis Antonio Perez. Hi, my name's Emily Williams. I'm a producer on My Story So Far and part of a big team that helps make the podcast. A lot of the stories you hear in this show are people sharing their experiences on stage for the first time ever. If you want more people to hear this unique podcast built around first-person stories from communities around Colorado, you can help us out right now. Please rate the show on your favorite podcast app or write a review. It helps other people discover my story so far. Thanks for listening and supporting podcasts from Colorado Public Radio.